Well, thanks to Pastor Alex and the team for last week for covering for us. We appreciate it. Everything went well. We never doubted. It was just nice to be able to get away for a day or so. But today's message, we're going to begin a series, actually. I don't know how long the series is going to last. I know it's going to be longer than today. Therefore, it is a series. Okay? And it is entitled Boat Number 5. That's the title. It should be up behind me. Is it up behind me? No. Yeah, it's right there. That's the title, right there. Boat number five. That's the title of my sermons. Now, some of you are like, what does that mean? Let me explain. On April 15th, 1912, in the North Atlantic Ocean, the ship Titanic sank. This is a picture that Ray took from the original, <laughs> from the original Titanic. That's just, that's just terrible. That's just... <laughs> Never mind. But anyway, thanks for that picture, Ray. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I'll, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So that, that's boat number five. Let me explain. On the Titanic, there were 20 lifeboats. There should have been more, but that was the minimum that they needed according to maritime law then. So there were only 20 lifeboats on that ship. Only 18 of them were used. Two of them capsized and were never used. So 18 lifeboats. On that ship were 2,224 people. That day they estimate between 1,490 to 1,635 people died. Only 700 some people survived the Titanic. 75% perished, 25% survived. Now the fact of the matter is only two boats returned Two, two lifeboats returned to the Titanic. Boat number four and boat number 14. After they were dropped in the water and rowed away and after the Titanic sank, they went back to the site to rescue people. They did rescue a few. Some who died in the boat, some who clung, held on until they slipped into the dark cold water of the Atlantic. But only two boats returned. Boat number five is very interesting to me. It was the second lifeboat that was launched, second in the water. It had between 35 and 36 people. In fact, you can go to a website, they actually have the names of the people that were on each individual boat, according to the manifest. Second one to be lost, but, uh, launched, but here's what's important. They were the first one to reach the US Carpathia, which was the ship that was about 18 miles away, I believe, from the Titanic that came to help rescue. Second one lost, first one to the rescue ship. Mr. Herbert John Pittman, he was the third officer, he was in charge of boat number five because they had to put a crew member in each boat to say that they were in charge. He was in, in charge. So Mr. Pittman was in charge. Once everybody was in and they moved away from the ship, he wanted to go back. On this boat though were 29 first class um, passengers, one deck officer, and six crew members. That's what made up boat number five. He wanted to return, but here is what was reported and here is what was said by those 29 first class people. Why should we lose ourselves in a useless attempt to save others from the ship? Why should we lose our lives in a useless attempt to save others from the ship? They never went back. In fact, they rode faster and harder to get to that rescue ship. It is told that Mr. Pittman was haunted by that decision the rest of his days. It says that he at night would awaken Hearing in his head, whether it was real or not, but hearing the cries of people as they drowned and sank in the North Atlantic Ocean. He regretted that decision the rest of his days. You're like, hi, hey, Pastor Steve. Been watching the History Channel too much, huh? I gotta be honest with you, this message started stirring about two weeks ago, two or two and a half, right when I was finishing up No Entiendo. And this one began to, st and I never thought I'd go to the Titanic. I mean, I didn't like the movie. 
And first of all, we went to see the movie. It was stupid because the sh ship still sunk. I mean, I didn't see, oh, I knew what was going to happen. Good thing there are snacks, raisin nuts. They're the best. <laughs> but here's a question. Are you, am I, are we in boat number five? Seriously ask yourself that question. Are you, am I, are we in boat number five? Have we given up? Have we called it a day? Have we accepted things as they are? Are we accepting things as we are? And all these questions hopefully are going to make sense as I move forward with this message. But these are questions I want you to be pondering right now. Because here's the fact, no doubt, everything that is happening around us is in preparation for the return of Jesus Christ. The scripture is very clear. We see the turmoil that's going over in the Middle East. We see what's going on with Israel. We see all these countries that are just wanting to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And why is it? Because Israel still represents God. And the God of this world, the little g of this world, Satan, does not want Israel to exist. So you see that happening in a, in, in a, in, in a flash. It is, it is changing by the minute. We, we see it happen. We see what's happening now in, in our country. We see globally, economy, economically. We see all these different things happening. We you hear talk of a one world government, one world currency. You hear all, the, all, this is, all this is prophesied in the book of Revelation, and then in Ezekiel and throughout the Bible. All these prophecies are there showing this is what will come. And this isn't to say, to, to scare people. This is just to be prepared. Because Christ is returning. Christ is returning. And when you see such abominations of God's word, when you see people take God's word, twist it, and to make it their own, that's an abomination. That's like bringing a, a, an idol into the house of God and bowing down to that idol. For example, the governor of New York, the new governor, a lady person, whatever her name is, they got rid of one idiot and got a new one. In fact, the bigger idiot. My daughter sent me this clip. I, I'm trying to avoid the news. I really, really am trying to avoid the news. Because I tell you what, I did see my doctor for my yearly physical. He checked my veins and the neck. You know, he says, man, they are, they're as clear as bell. I know. I know. Because when I see stuff, it just blows whatever's in there right out. One of these days, I don't want to like, have, oh, I, I got to, you know. So I've tried to avoid, but she sent me this clip and I was like, oh, for the love of Pete. You ever just want to, no, never mind. So I was like, and, and, and the governor of the governor of New York preaching, because she was preaching, she was preaching. She says, you know, people that are unvaccinated, basically you don't know Jesus because Jesus is a God of love and you would get vaccinated. Jesus wants you to get vaccinated. Jesus wants you. Now, again, just so we're clear, I'm not against the vaccine. I'm not for it and against it. You want to get it? Great. You don't want to get it? Great. I don't care. I care about when someone threatens you, threatens you and says you're going to lose your job if you don't take this stupid shot. See, I'm against that. But this lady's up there. She says to all those people, wherever she was standing, she said to all these people, listen, you go out and be my apostles. And go out and convince people to, to get vaccinated. All the people are going, oh, that's wonderful. She's a Christian. She was talking about Jesus. I'm going to get a vaccine because I love Jesus and I love people. I'm going to be honest with you. I love people. I would do anything for people. But that, me getting vaccinated has nothing to do with loving you. Nothing. And Jesus doesn't care if I get vaccinated. I, I, looked, I looked in the Bible. I actually opened it up. I'm like, hmm. I even Googled it. Jesus wants you to be vaccinated scripture. <laughs> I couldn't find it. I, I looked. I mean, I looked. I Googled it. I Yahooed it. I duck, duck, goaded it. I did all these. And, 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 and I couldn't find the scripture that she was quoting. Because she's an idiot. And she's an abomination. And she stands there and uses Jesus to try to manipulate. So the question is, what are we doing? What boat are we in? And let me say this to you. Jesus Christ isn't back yet. He's not back yet. How do I know this? Where's your mom? Oh, she left. So I think she went. What? 
I think I just skipped a beat there for a second. <laughs> I was going to say, if she's still here, he ain't back yet. Okay, most of us are on the bubble. Herb, and then she's not there. I'm like, uh. <laughs> I'm sweating. I hear this more and more, and I understand the statement, but I think we need to examine it as a church. Because here, listen, folks, we're a church. We're a body of believers who have come together, whether you know Christ or you don't know Christ, but you're here and you're being taught and you're being, it's, it's got to be explained. This is where we grow. This is where we're challenged. This is, this is where we help each other out. This is where we pray for one another. This is where we rejoice with those who rejoice and we cry with those who cry. This is all part of it. We get the opportunity to tell people about Christ. And again, 45, seven, eight years ago, the only reason I came to church is I came with her because she was pretty. She still is, in my opinion, but I only came with her. She had a great pair of jeans on. But uh, I mean, the, and, and, and that's the only reason I came to church. And the only reason I stayed is because she was pretty. And I stayed there, even though they're clapping hands and waving, asking questions. You're not allowed to ask questions at church. But then God started to get a hold of my life, little by little by little by little by little, until I understood. And see, what we have to do is understand, we have to look at this statement I'm about to make. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Lord Jesus, come quickly. I hear that a lot. And I understand what people are saying. But I think we, we, have, to, we have to look into Scripture. Paul kind of said the same thing. He didn't say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verse 23 and 24. The book of Philippians chapter 1, 23 and 24. As you're turning to it, whether it's on your phone or whatever, um, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 23. Paul is speaking to the church of Philippi. This is what he says. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better by far. Which is better by far. Okay? Verse number 24. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in this body. So Paul was saying what so many people are saying today, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You look at all the things that are going on in the world. You see the violence. You see the hatred. You see the stupidity. You see the threats. You see all this stuff. And people are like, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I get it. Paul gets it. He says, dude, if I had my choice to be here or to be with the Lord, I want to be with the Lord. But you need me. You need me. Therefore, I will stay. I won't just exist. I will be present. There's a difference. A lot of people today, a lot of Christians today I see are just existing. They're waiting to the blessed hope, which is the return of Jesus Christ. They're just existing, but they're not present. When your faith in Christ, when you put your hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I know where I'm going. I know where my future holds. I know who holds my future. It's him. Therefore, I just don't want to exist. I want to be present. I want to be present amongst the things. I want to be present to be able to speak the truth. I want to have the same First Amendment rights that I have that somebody would have that would say, I don't have. They have the right to say I don't have it. But I also have the right to say I have it because that's the First Amendment rights. See, all of these things I, I, I see and I, I think we have to look at it. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ. Which is better by far. Better by far. No doubt. No more tears. No more sorrows. You're in the presence of the Lord. If you're a Christian, you stand before the Lord the moment that you take that last breath. You stand before the Lord. He's, he's sitting there and he says, come on in. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. That's an awesome thing to wait, look forward to. But see, I look at something beyond that. I look at those that won't hear those words. And they need... To hear those words. The church today, Christians today, I believe, must not lose sight of what the Apostle Paul is saying. No doubt the church will be taken out on the day that Christ returns. But we need to hold on to living like we are already gone. I, maybe because I've been an athlete all my life, and when I was in college and I know it's hard for you to believe I was a swimmer in college. Um, yeah, I was 70 pounds lighter than I am right now. I was still this short, vertically challenged. Most of the people I was swimming against was J. 
Jakester's size that was playing the piano. He's got the wingspan of an albatross. And, uh, and uh, so in a 50 yard race, he takes like four strokes. I take 78 and I'm supposed to beat him. But something I learned through my years of high school and then college sports and being on a national level at, in, in Boston was the fact that when I got on that starting block, even though the crowd, because it's not like tennis, tennis and golf are stupid. <laughs> not, not the sport, not the athletes that play it. They're, they're great athletes. I can't, I, I can hit a one iron. Well, at least I, I used to. I can hit a one iron. I guess people aren't supposed to. I throw the ball up, I crack it, it goes. All right. Uh, tennis, I can only play tennis if they put a screen up top because that ball's gone, man. It is soaring. But tennis and, and golf, you got to be quiet. The crowd has to be quiet so they can concentrate. How stupid. <laughs> How stupid. We're just talking about there should be full contact golfing. <laughs> like, you know, everybody, and I haven't been golfing much, but they, they hit the ball <laughs> for the love of Pete. So, what I think they should have a guy with or without pads, it doesn't matter. Like with a little time, they get a three second start and then that guy's coming at him full tilt. I think I would watch golf. <laughs> Just saying. But, you know, so those sports, when they serve or putt or tee off, oh, you gotta be quiet. But when the ball's in the air, everybody goes, oh, look at the ball, it's so fun. <laughs> Swimming, it's not like that. Swimming, they do tell you to quiet the crowd. But you know what? When you're trained, you don't hear the crowd. You, you don't hear them. Because all you're focused on is hearing that gun. That's all you hear. When you hit the water, people are screaming. But you're only trained to hear your coach whistle. That's all you're trained to hear. The Church of Jesus Christ has to understand something. We have to put out all the things on the outside and we have to train and focus our eyes, as it says in 1 Corinthians 9.25, we are to focus our eyes upon the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that is our finish line, that is where we're to go, that is where we're to stay focused. For example, in Luke, you can turn your Bibles, Luke chapter 19. I'm not going to read 11 through 27, I'm just going to kind of give you the synopsis of what that is. But here's what it says in Luke 19, 11 through 27. The master is going to leave for a period of time. He calls his servants together. He says, I'm going to leave for a period of time. He gives them ten, uh, um, min 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 what, ten dollars each. He says, here, t t take care of it. I'm going to use it. When you want to get back? I'll want it back. He says, okay, we'll do it. The master said he's going away, but he would return. He would return. The reason for this parable is very simple. In verse number 11... While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So here in this parable, these people, these followers of Christ, or these in the story, they thought that Christ was establishing his kingdom right now. Now there's a theology that's out there now, which is absolutely absurd, but so many people are falling for it. It's called Kingdom Now Theology, which they believe that the church has the ability to call in God's glory, to pour into this country, that God's glory is just going to overtake our cities, and God's going to establish his, his millennial reign and everything right here, right now, which is falsehood. It, that's, a, that's apostasy of scripture. That is very, very false. It's not true. There's no truth in it at all. Because the fact of the matter is, it's only going to get worse. The world's going to get worse. But hear me. But the church is going to get stronger. Because the church has to go through this to get stronger. I told my wife yesterday, the church has been nursed too long. The church has been nursed too long. It has. It, it's been pampered, you know. It's like the first child in your home. That kid, they burped, you rushed him to the hospital. <laughs> They rolled over, whatever happened. You, their poop changed color. You rushed them to the hospital. You know, it's like you're freaking out. Third kid, what do you care? I mean, what, 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 what's really, what do you really care? Here, give them a cheeseburger. But they don't have any teeth. Ah, they'll nod to death. 
But the thing is, we've been, we've been pampered. The church has been pampered. The United States, the American church has been pampered for way too long. It really has. So the key verse here, so I, explain, I don't want to get off track, <laughs> which is bizarre. So the key verse here and the purpose for this is found in verse number 13. And I'm going to read out the King James Version because it's so appropriate, the, the, more of a direct translation of what it says here in Luke chapter 19, verse number 13. So he said, I got to go, I'm going to come back here. I'm coming back, so be prepared. Verse number 13 says this. And he called his ten servants and, and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them this, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. In other words, another translation is, labor until I come. Work until I come. Don't give up. Don't call it a day. Don't get discouraged. Don't get disheartened. Don't get downtrodden. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't stop. And the church today is stopping because we're crying out, Lord Jesus, come quickly. When in fact, the church shouldn't be backing off. We shouldn't. We were talking again last night, you were saying, um, you know, how gas and everything's going up and they're, they want to go to all electric cars by whatever. And I, I, just, I just saw one of the electric um, Ford Mustangs. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, what is that? Oh. <laughs> what is that? What is, you letting the air out of balloon? Eep, 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 eep. Stupid. I would be, if someone gave me one, I'd be embarrassed. If you just say, hey, Pastor, I want you to have this. No. 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 Give me a Yugo with no muffler. I'll take that. What's, what's the point? So Chair says, well, Steve, what happens if they go to all electric cars and you have your truck and you pull the trailer? What are you going to do? I'm going to pull the trailer with my truck <laughs> every Sunday to church. I don't care. See, the, the, the church, we backed off so much. I'm telling you, and you've heard it. I don't want to harp on it, but I guess I am. But we have, the church bowed, bowed to, the, to, to this world back in March of last year. The church crumbled to, to society, crumbled to the government, crumbled, just putts right out. Literally, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's like, you ever seen a boneless chicken? Why can you buy boneless chicken when there are no boneless chickens? You know what I'm saying? You ever thought about that? Like if you had a real live boneless chicken, it would just be there. It would just be like, there. Be like, come on chicken, it couldn't move because it's boneless, if it could roll maybe. I don't know, I, these are things I've thought about on our 23 hour vacation. That's probably why we needed to come home. But what the, boneless chicken, but you, without, a, without, without a skeleton, you can't, you can't move. The church lost its spine. Christians lost their spine. When the pandemic hit, I started sending out the YouTube videos to, to everybody in my phone book. You know how many times I got blocked? A lot. But you know what? I don't care. I don't care. At least I'm telling people. At least I tell people when I see them. I talk to people. Why? Because Jesus is coming. But I'm still present. I'm not just existing. I'm still present. I'm still here. I'm still here. Why? To, tear, to tell and share the good news of Jesus Christ with people. That's who we are. That's what we're supposed to be. Jesus said this, occupy till I come. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't cease living out a life in Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you again, I've been a Christian for 48 years. Being a Christian, again, I, being at 17, accepting Christ uh, in my life. So again, I... I, I lived up to 17 without knowing Christ, but then accepting Christ in my life and, and living all the rest of my life up to this day for Christ. Have I felt like I've missed things in life? Absolutely not. Have I feel like I've been spared from many things in life? Many things in life? Absolutely yes. Am I grateful for knowing Christ at the age of 17? I am, but I wish I would have known him sooner. 
especially the way I grew up. I wish I would have known him sooner. Am I grateful for the opportunities that God has given me over the last 48 years to, to serve him and to be a part of him? Not being just a pastor. Who cares about being a pastor part? Whoopee. The fact of the matter is I've been able to tell people and share Christ with people. Why? Because Jesus Christ cares for them. And this world could care less about them. So I look at that and I go, man, what an opportunity. So we're not just a, oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly, come save me. Stop saying it. Stop just standing around waiting to just get hoovered up. We're all getting hoovered up. I'm looking forward to being so totally off guard. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what that looks like. And there could be an embarrassing moment. I mean, think about it. Had Mexican the night before, now what happens? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Just saying. Could be a little embarrassing. But I look forward to being caught off guard. Not, not caught off guard, just whoop, gone. He's gone. You know, like, whew, I'm gone. But I want to be doing something. I had to go meet with my uh, retirement guy. I haven't met with him in like five years he goes it's like oh he goes pastor you're 64 now you're going to retire he goes i know that's a dumb question to ask I go, it is a dumb question i said why am i going to retire i'm going to die with my boots on Amen. what why why retire what's that retirement thing about i mean i why retire what, what's the purpose of retiring no i'm gonna just go until you know there's nothing more to go with i'm just gonna go keep going that's what the church is. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to run and hide. We're not supposed to go, oh my goodness, look at everything that's happening. Lord Jesus, come quickly. No, all that happens to make us prepared. To, so we have an urgency that we face in our heart that, hey, our families need to hear about Christ. Our relatives need to hear about Christ. Our friends need to hear about Christ. Our co-workers need to hear about Christ. We need to do everything we can for people to know about Jesus Christ. I don't know how else to say it. Now again, I understand when, it's done, when people say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I understand that. But we all see what goes on around us. And I feel like it's only going to go from bad to worse. It really is. Everybody's like, oh, in the 2022 election, once the Republicans take back the House and the Senate, everything's just going to be peachy. Yes, peachy. Just hang on. Hang on. And once we take it back, everything will be good. No. No. You know why? It's still a man in charge. I mean, would I want somebody who's pro-abortion to be in there? No. Pro-life? Yes. No doubt. There's no doubt. So whoever that is, that's who I'm voting for. Okay? But the fact is, People are like, oh, we just gonna, everything's going to be better. Everything's just, no, it's, it, th th this train has left the station. And it's going to just keep getting hammered and hammered. And I'm telling you, the church, they're going to come after the church more and more. There's already things in the works to go after. You see the pastor in Canada got, got arrested again, again. And now they're threatening to throw him in jail and not throw away the key. For preaching, for not stopping having church because of the COVID restrictions. They physically have come in his church, arrested him in front of his congregation, and drug him while his feet are dragging behind him into the cop cars, takes him to jail, and they throw him in jail. And he had, I heard him say the other day, he has a word for the church in America. And this was his word. It's coming to America. It's coming to America. And it's going to come to the place where you as a Christian, you can't put a Bible on your desk, but somebody could put whatever on their desk. Well, keep putting the Bible on your desk. Yeah, but I'll get fired. You know what? Maybe you need to fight. Maybe you need to fight a little bit. Maybe you need to like say, no, 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 wait a minute. If you can put your satanic garbage on your desk, why can't I put my godly stuff... Plus, look, the, the, the governor of New York is a Christian. <laughs> All of what has happened, without a doubt, has been demonically inspired. From the pandemic, people are like, I don't, 
I, they, they still don't know where it came from. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah, ooh. <laughs> they had to go into a bat cave, not the bat cave, but they had to go into a cave full of bats. They had to extract that thing from bat poop and they had to bring it back to a laboratory. I mean, that just, first of all, that. Why, why do you need bat poop? I used to hunt bats back in Pet Pittsburgh. Right at dusk, it was a great time. Really work, sight in your shotguns. You throw stones up, bats fly down, boom! Blow them right out of the air, it's a lot of fun. Just saying. You don't wanna go into a bat cave. There are bats in there. And they got rabies and they got teeth. And they get unhappy when you go in their caves. They don't like that. So we had some dipsticks in China go in some bat cave with little vials going, oh, will you give me a little of your poop, please, so I can go take it back to my lab so I can work on if we ever get this poop in our system, what we can do against it? Wrong, the communist country, the communist Chinese government developed that as a virus. There's no doubt about it. And it was released into this world. Personally, I, my opinion is it wasn't accidental. I believe it was sent out there just to kind of punish our government for putting all these tariffs on them and fighting back and the Chinese government like we got billions of people we don't care if we blow off some in our country or further you know we'll just take it over I believe that I do believe that I believe that that's how it happened but from that from everything that's transpired all of that from the moment that first numbskull went in there with a little vial looking for bat poop to the time it was released has been demonically inspired everything we see going on in our society demonically inspired Everything we hear in our, 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 in our society, in our culture, and everything, demonically inspired. Everything. Everything. But see, what, what we have to understand is, hey, we're not gone yet. Real quick, because I want to get to this passage. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. It's towards the back of the Bible. Um, 1 John chapter 4. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number 6. Now remember this. We are not out of here yet. Chapter four, first John chapter 4, verse number 1, as Paul writes, he's, or John writes, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. Oh, huh, wonder if that governor is from God. Yeah, go be apostles of all and God and tell people because Jesus wants you to get vaccinated. Moron! It's not of God. It's not of God. Okay, so let's go. But, the, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because, oh, got this, many false prophets have gone out into the world. I would call her a false prophet. Because she invoked the name of Jesus. I'd call her a false prophet. I'd call any pastor who stands behind a pulpit or whatever, music stand or whatever, and doesn't proclaim the whole gospel of Jesus Christ because you're afraid of offending somebody, a false prophet. That's what it says. Because many false prophets have gone out in the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is, for, is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Small a, not the big a, not the Antichrist, but someone who is against Christ. Who pretends to be of Christ, but isn't of Christ. So you understand. Which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. <gasps> is the Antichrist in the world right now? C could be. The, the T-H-E, the, and capital A, anti, a, 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 anti, a, n, t, i, c, h, r, i, s, t. Could be, could be, yes, very possible, could be. But have there been little Antichrist? Oh yeah, anybody that has the spirit that goes against Christ. Yes, this is true. The, John talks about it right here. They could be here right now. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Now stop right there. See, right there, people miss that passage. They're so concerned about everything going on, all the signs, all these things, that they're getting so focused on that, the churches and people are giving up. When I look at it and say, this is something that should inspire us to go out and to become a better servant of Christ. We should, we should be more willing. We should be more ready. We should be more wanting. i got to be honest with you, I'm going to brag about Tuesday night prayer. Some of you haven't been there yet. I strongly recognize, by the way, we have prayer on Tuesday nights. Did I mention that? We have prayer on Tuesday nights. It's at 7 o'clock at our ministry center, 16201, 118th Avenue, Orland Park, Illinois, 60467. There it is. 
Nice job. Okay, so we have prayer on Tuesday nights. Yes, this Tuesday we do fast. I'm happy about it. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, yes, we will fast. We will pray. But you know what's so cool? The, the number of people coming to prayer on Tuesday nights is growing. I'm going to say this to you again. You need to come Tuesday night prayer. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know how to pray. You sit there and just keep your mouth shut. Bring a snack. Bring a snack for everybody. Because <laughs> we're, we're done fasting by that time. It's dark, believe me. Bring out the snacks. Just nothing crunchy, like, like soft chocolate chips with no nuts. Anything that you're thinking about. This. But you need that. Tuesday night or uh, Thursday night here has women's Bible study. Ladies, come to church's Bible study. Why? Because you need it. You, ne you, you need it. Sign up. Men's Bible study. When's ours? Two weeks? I don't know. When's our Bible study? 11th. The 11th. We have men's Bible study. Ministry center. 6.30 because we have food. We have food. 6.30, then we're done. We're out by 8 o'clock. You should need to come. Young or old, I don't care how old you are. Come to men's Bible study. Come on. You know? You, why? You need it. We have these things. You, young, oh, uh, there's youths. Young people. Parents, why do you need to get your kids to youth group? Because they need it. Oh, but they're going to fight with me. I, they just yell all the time. I just Get them in the car. Drop them off. There's five acres. If they're going to run free, they'll get lost in the cornfield. They'll find them helicopter search. No worries. It's fine. Just bring them. Yeah, but I don't want to hear it afterwards. Put cotton in your ears. But go to the gun range. Get a set of muffs. Put them on. You don't hear squat, man. You just did beautiful sound. That's what you hear. Kick them out of the car, slow down to about 20, boot them right out the side, let them roll right into the grass, they roll right into the four season room. Bring them to youth group. Why? Because they need it. It is not time for the church to, re, re, to, to retreat. It is not time. Because right here he says, he that is within us is greater than he that is in the world. God is greater. God is greater. I have stood in his presence. I know that God is greater. And when I don't think he's as great as anything else, that's my fault, not his. Anybody ever get there like that? They're from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So right here he is saying this. I see the danger of being in boat number five. I see that we're in and we don't care about anybody else. I'm safe. But you know what? This church, we're going to drill a hole in boat number five. Because we need to understand that we need to keep reaching. We need to keep going. We need to keep. We need to keep. We need to keep. It's not something we just pick up and drop. I'm grateful that I'm going to know that I know Christ and I'm going to heaven. But do I want Jesus to come now? No. I don't. I do not want Jesus to return. Because there's other people in my life that have yet to know him. Am I ready for him to return? Yes. But I don't want him to because I want more people to hear about the good news. I want people to know the Savior that saved me. That's what I want people to know. Just come to him. Surrender your life to him. Find for the first time in your life the fullness of his spirit. Come into his love and know him. See, to me there is a sea of souls. They're perishing. So I ask myself this, Lord, get me out of here, or do I decide to fight and stay the course? Over the next week or two or however long the series goes, this is what we're going to be looking at. What does that look like? What does that mean? How? How? But please, if you walk out of here, with, take this with you. He that is within us is greater than he that is in the world. All you got to do is call upon the name of the Lord. Capiche? Why don't you bow your heads? Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word of truth and hope and encouragement. 
I ask, Lord Jesus, that right now in every one of our lives, that God, that we'd see the urgency of the hour. And that, Father God, that you would speak to every heart and life. Lord, I'm grateful for those that are in the boats. But, Lord, there's others that need to be rescued. If there is any here this morning, God, in this room that need to know you in their heart as their Lord and Savior, I pray, God, it is time for them to be rescued. With your heads bowed for just a moment, we do this every week. Those of you at home, if you would like to pray this, you're more, more than welcome to. We give people the opportunity to accept Christ in their life and to begin the journey. To start, the, to start fresh. If you want to pray with me, you're going to stay right where you're at. I'm going to stay right here. If you want to pray to accept Christ, this is where you begin. You, it, now, now listen, don't try to get a, to be a good person to come to know Christ. That's backwards, man. Come to Christ as you are. And he makes you into a righteous person. If you want to pray with me, all I'm going to do in a moment, I'll look across this room, I'll ask you to look up at me. Once I see your eyes, you can close your eyes. And then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you pray this from your heart. And this will be the beginning. On my left, you want to pray? Look at me right now. Sure. Got him. Any more? Cool. Got him. My right. All I got to see is your eyes. Sure. Got him. Any more? Cool. All right. Pray this from your heart. Lord Jesus, here I am. I realize you already know me. I come to you with my heart. And I give it to you. I ask Lord Jesus that you come into my life. I give you my sin, my failures. I give you my whole life. And I take on the new life that you have for me. Lord Jesus, I receive you today. Thank you for giving me a new hope. Why don't you all stand? If you'd like prayer this morning, we've got people up here who'd like to pray for you. Whatever the need is. If we could have a few guys give us a hand, clean it up, I'd appreciate it. But let me close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and all that you're going to continue to do. I pray, Lord Jesus, as we go out into this lost, broken, dying world, that God, we don't go out defeated. But we go out knowing that we carry the hope of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that you give us opportunity. Bless each and every one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.